Welcome to another dubious episode of the Kids Seriously Show, where the only podcast around that refuses to resign despite the horrific transgressions of the Knightsville brothers. Every now and again, we get together to discuss the world. We play our famous trivia question game show, discuss other things from Nerdland that might tickle our fancy, and once in a while, review a trailer. To my left, it's everyone's favorite governor. It's Luke Knightsville. And to my right, way to my right, it's the majority whip himself. It's Mark Knightsville. Me. I'm Maya Madrid. Boys, how are you? I'm pretty good. I, you know, Aquaman's the highest grossing DC movie of all time, <laughs> which is, you know, reason to celebrate. It's a magical adventure that is loved the world over. And, uh, you know, it's it's the type of thing, you know, that shitty movies like Solo aspire to be. And maybe one day they'll be able to catch on and really connect with audiences the way that, that Aquaman has. So I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm battling a cold over here so i've been sniffling and coughing and it, it's kind of magical though for the first time in 17 years i'm living somewhere where it snowed and so we've got flurries outside right now none of it's going to stick so none of it's going to prevent me from having to go into work tomorrow but it, it has me feeling very whimsical which uh, is a, a nice place to be in considering the conversation we're going to have later I'm curious how many inches of snow it would take to close things <laughs> down there, because I'm assuming it's not very much. Oh, it, less than an inch, because it's actually not even the snow, it's the ice, um, and that they just don't have the salt in the trucks to compensate for it. So the, the major highways will be fine, but every side road is just covered in ice and can be unnavigable. Lady Madrid is in a walk right now. I think that's important to uh, to note. Our driveway is one big icicle, <laughs> uh, so I've been ice skating around on that. Uh, my wife has been doing it more than I have, so I've just been sitting inside watching that new AAF football league that we were talking about right before the show here, and so it's been a good, good weekend for me, guys. Which I'm assuming stands for American as fuck? Uh, no, it's uh, Alliance of American Football. Oh. It doesn't have quite the the trumpest thing that you might expect it's very much just sort of by the bones football it's the, the theme basically is all these guys are trying to get back into the nfl <coughs> and actually the quality is really good so i'm excited Do they have fair catches i believe they have fair catches i haven't seen any that i think of but i believe they have fair catches they have most of the same rules you have to go for two they don't allow kickoffs because they don't want needless injury so it's like the opposite of the XFL, wow. like that coin toss where they just throw the ball and let the dudes fight over it. <laughs> so it's uh, it's really like it, it's you know like in order because it's a developmental league, um, they they try not to or they don't let, allow you to blitz more than one guy more than four. So you can only bring five guys in pressure. Um, but then to compensate for that, they don't throw a lot of the flags that the NFL does. So it's. Um, you know, there was there's one hit that that went viral on, uh, um, I think it was San Diego's quarterback Mike Ber- uh, Berkovicki, and it was just like it was unbelievable. Like it would have been, they would have gotten killed if they had been in the NFL. Like that guy would have been suspended for life. So, so who are the? Because all I remember about the XFL was that they uh, didn't allow fair catches. So basically, after the first game, no uh, kickoff returner would ever touch the ball. They would just immediately. Well, doesn't Canadian football not allow fair catches? Yeah, I believe that is, that's correct. Yeah. What, who are, so who are the big names in this? Cause I, did I hear Trent Richardson? Yep, Trent name? Richardson plays for Maya Madrid's uh, Birmingham Iron. And uh, for Atlanta, although he's not a starter, was a guy named, uh, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Andy Murray, who's a quarterback at Georgia. Um, trying to think of other big name guys. Is it? Is yeah, it? You so, say it's developmental. So is it mostly younger players who didn't get drafted, or is it more guys who we've heard of but they only had a couple seasons or are old, or is it a solid mix? Like, what's the what's the Rod makeup here? Smart still bumming around. Rod Smart. Uh, no, he hate me is unfortunately retired because that would be amazing. But um, so like the quarterback of the Iron, for instance, is um, is uh, Luis Perez, and he was like the D two Heisman. So that's kind of like an underground guy that not a lot of people. No, um, where Mike Berkovicki, the quarterback for the fleet, San Diego fleet, is like ASU's former quarterback. So it's really kind of like a mix 
mixture of guys who you know if you watch a lot of college football and guys who, um, you know, are D2, D3 players trying to catch on. But the end result is the game is very fast. It's very, like, NFL fast. I mean, it's, it, it's like watching the best players in college who haven't had time to gel yet. So it'll be interesting, you know, because everybody signs a three-year contract. So how much, you know, from this year to next year, how much turnover there is to see if they can like gel as teams because the offensive line play is not very good. So there's a lot of pressure on the quarterbacks and the running game has, has struggled to get going, but um, you know, that'll, that'll improve as the offensive lines get better. Nice. All righty. So uh, speaking of football, we should probably get to Mike Singletary's favorite game show. It's Am I Right or Am I Wrong? And in true American style, our contestants will offer up earnest opinions, which will either be taken as fact or immediately mocked by our moderator. Here how, here's how the two-player version of our game works. There's seven questions. Each baller goes back and forth in a serpentine way, not unlike the gaze of Adam Gase. The winner gets four. To win, you must get four. Tonight, our moderator is our former champion, Luke Neitzel, who's coming to the chorus now. Luke, take it away. You know, it's interesting that you made it football theme, talking about the American's Fuck League, and then also with doing the Adam Gase, Mike Singletary references in this, because our first question is football related. <laughs> And I believe Mark is going to have to go first because he is winning or the champion or whatever we do. Um, so this is this is question one. Now, since we last got together, we took a week off because of uh, the Super Bowl. We all had various parties and things to attend to because we're highly sociable people. Uh, so we were unable to record because we were all watching the Super Bowl. And I think everyone can agree that uh, this was... The most exciting Super Bowl ever, mainly because we all got to see Adam Levine's nipples for an extended period of time, and him hold a guitar while not actually playing it, which was very interesting. So, I'm going to ask some Super Bowl halftime-related shows. (coughs) Now, I'm sure we all remember the the glorious 1991 Super Bowl halftime show that featured uh, Minnesota's Salute to Winter, that included marching bands and, and various other dancing routines that celebrated everyone's favorite season. But then, you know, not too long after that, they had the Michael Jackson 3D Super Bowl halftime show. And that's what kicked off really the modern era of Super Bowl halftime shows where you get a big musical act and have them perform a melody or maybe some duets or something like that. So we've had a lot of these. And I think we can all agree that Maroon 5 was not a great choice this year for most anyone. And I want to know... You're planning the next Super Bowl. You have to pick the halftime act. You have to pick someone who hasn't done it before. Who are you going to? Who is going to be the best? And I want to I want to preface this that it has to be living people. So you can say you want to do the Beatles. You're getting just Ringo and McCartney. Okay? You can't resurrect people. You know, if you want Nirvana, you're getting Novoselic and, you know, that guy from the Foo Fighters that uh, no one's ever heard of. Um, so let me know who is going to be your halftime act. And just as a special bonus, if you actually get the written answer on this, you're going to get three points because I guarantee you, you're not going to get it. So Mark, we start with you. Hmm. Okay. So the big problem with the, the halftime shows is that they're getting overproduced and you're getting too many people in there. So I think the first thing you want to do is you want to pare it down and you want to have just one act without 20 guest stars. Um, Now, traditionally you go rock. There aren't a lot of bands left that can pull off that big a venue that haven't already done it. Um, I, I mean, I want to say that the biggest one that could do it would be Pearl Jam, um, my personal favorite. But I don't know that they have any songs that are really going to translate well into that game. Um, you could go a, a slightly smaller act, but I, my my next thought would be my second favorite band, the Dropkick Murphys. But while I think that that would be something very good atmosphere-wise, I don't know that it would be popular enough. So I'm going to go a completely different route. And I think what the NFL should do is 
Reunite Outcast. Not only is that a hugely popular act that could play that venue, has the kind of songs that would be appealing to middle America. It also looks forward a little more in music, in incorporating a, a more hip hop based act. And you're going to get just tons of street cred just for being able to reunite them and having people be able to see them play one more time. So I'm going outcast. Maya? My response is, first of all, Mark should be disqualified for this question. Just in the most recent Super Bowl that we saw a week ago, Big Boy from Outcast performed. So technically, um, that person would have already performed. But I would like to go with another hip-hop act. I'd like to do it for the next Los Angeles Super Bowl when the Rams Stadium opens. And I would like to get uh, NWA back together uh, in <laughs> L.A. for because um, I think that would be awesome. And I think that would go over really, really well. And I think... Um, I should get the point because I picked somebody who hasn't done it before. It's true, but you also picked people that would never, ever, ever appear in this modern version of the NFL halftime show. That's why it wasn't in there. What? That's that's the whole reason Outcast wasn't in there because Andre 3000 refused to do it. Well, yeah, because they hate each other. Um, but no, I, I'm talking more about how uh, I I don't think I don't think that band, the band that sung "Motherfuck the Police," is gonna go be the showpiece for the NFL right now, which is why a lot of artists decline the Super Bowl this year. Listen, guys, you you got this all wrong. You're looking at this from the completely wrong perspective, right? Because we've had great musicians go out there and do their thing, but you get like what, seven minutes to do a medley or whatever. So I, Bruce Springsteen's amazing. Tom Petty's amazing. But I don't want to see them play just the chorus of, like, four songs and then head on out or whatever. I want big, dumb, bubblegum, disposable spectacle. And that's why, if we're going to talk about reuniting bands, we're going to reunite the Spice Girls. Let them <laughs> fall around drunk on stage or do whatever the hell they do. You know, with a giant inflatable whatever's behind them and light shows. Man, you, you guys are too dour. You're not fun. Um, th th this is a tough one for me. I, I, I honestly want to give Mark the point, but even... But Jeremiah brought up exactly what I was thinking is that Big Boy performed like a week ago. So <laughs> I guess I have to give the point to Maya, though. It, I don't like his answer either, to be honest. So we're going to go... Yeah, you know what? If they did him... Because they have NWA, and then you think they'd just bring out Kaepernick to take a knee on the stage right in the middle, and it would never happen. Money I, is plausible. I, hon I honestly, I honestly was hoping that um, that that Big Boy would take a knee on the stage when he was oh, out there you, for his thing. You, you said we, you said we couldn't have the Beatles because because Lennon and Harrison are dead, but you can have NWA when Easy E is dead. Well, he would be bringing out the other members, so I mean. Basically, Dr. Dre and Ice Cube, I think, is a, a pretty reasonably entertaining concert to go to. And, you know, the other two guys that I don't remember the name of because I'm a white kid from Minnesota. So MC Red. Yeah. And there was another one, too. I, I saw part of the movie on HBO. So we're going to move on. Maya gets the point. He is currently up one to nothing. And um, I did toy with making this an all Aquaman themed episode because... It was such a magical journey, and it has achieved so much, even when there were countless doubters and haters that just wanted to bag on it when they haven't even seen it, and lived the joy that is a giant Hawaiian man from Iowa, you know, having a friend of an octopus that plays drums and swimming and all that other great stuff that is Aquaman. But there isn't a lot of other Aquaman news, but there is a lot of DC news, and there is more specifically Batman news, and I am going to throw the most generic over beaten to death question about this new Batman movie coming up. We know Ben Affleck is gone. So we're going to need a new Batman in this, uh, the Batman movie. Who are you casting? And, uh, we're, we're hoping you, you have a good rationale for why you're casting that we'd like to hear as well. So we're going to start this time with Maya. Who is the new Batman for 2021's the Batman? Well, let me tell you, Luke, the last time DC made major casting news before Ben Affleck, when they hired Christian Bale and when they hired uh, Henry Cavill, I had correctly predicted both of those hires in years prior. So I'm on a little bit of a roll when it comes to uh, the big two uh, 
or two, I should say two of the big three characters from that particular company, even though I don't consider myself a fan any longer. It's a long way of getting around to say, look, you want stars, that's what DC has gotten most recently, and there's no bigger star, I think, and well-respected actor that would fit the role better than Kit Harrington. So Kit Harrington, he's so hot right now, is very popular, very good actor, has the look, has that sort of dour, gloomy Bruce Wayne thing that he could totally pull off. So that's where I'm going to go. Mark? Okay. So I actually answered this question on Twitter last week, and you, you might hate it, but I want you just to, to go with this, okay? So um, the writer for Miss Marvel, G. Willow Wilson, brought up the, the idea of who should be cast as the next Batman, and her argument was that the best actors – for Batman have been those with great eyebrows and because they convey so much of, um, you know, expression when the face is limited, you know, Michael Keaton, fantastic eyebrows, Christian Bale, great eyebrows, George Clooney, not so much. So her thesis was that you need great eyebrows in order to be a great Batman. And so you take that, combined with the fact that Aquaman is now the leading DC movie, leading in a lighter tone for the entire franchise. Just combine those two things. Great eyebrows, lighter tone. I am casting Eugene Levy as Bruce Wayne. Wow. Wow. You guys are something today, because, man, I hate both these answers <laughs> as, as well. So... Uh, the answer I had down was Nicholas Holt, uh, who who I would really actually want to be casted as uh, Batman. So, the, the Eugene Levy, I, you're not even trying, which is kind of yes, just... Yes, I am. You're... Yes, I am. Get him in a gym for a couple months beforehand. Let him bulk up. You do a Dark Knight Returns. Come on. Yeah, no, I'm not feeling that at all. Um, and I don't think Kit Harrington's a good actor. I think Kit Harrington is insanely vanilla and one dimensional. He actually is, I think, the new version of Taylor Kitsch. He's really good at one specific thing on one show where a bunch of people are able to elevate him. And everything I've seen that isn't that is not good. Uh, so I'm, I'm not a fan of his. I also really want, I really want a better Bruce Wayne, because I think the Bruce Waynes we've gotten have been really blah. I think Michael Keaton has been the best Bruce Wayne because he was charming and charismatic when he was in public, but then could do the the cranky and pissed off and could do the, you know, the let's get nuts. I might be psychotic type deal. I want where, where Bale, I thought was just kind of a bland, like, oh, I'm forced to be Bruce Wayne and and Val Kilmer and George Clooney, whatever. Um so, Have you not seen Best in Show? Who's more charming than Eugene Levy? Uh, uh, Michael McKeon is more charming in that movie. Anyways, uh, I'm I'm just for the the sake of making it interesting. I guess I'll give the the point to Mark because man, you really you really went outside the box there. And also Jeremiah talking about predicting how he always predicts them right, even though he he admitted at the beginning he didn't predict the last Batman. So we're tied yeah, we're tied one to one. Do I just have a good track? <laughs> I, I stand behind my pick. All right. This is this next one's gonna be an interesting one. I'm I've excited for this question. So I like to, you know, kill time and have shows on in the background, and they have to be a certain type of show while you're doing stuff because you can't you can't throw on a foreign film or you can't throw on true detective if you're doing other things, because you have to be able to really focus on what's happening or you're going to have no clue which end is up. So I like to find generally like comedies that I can throw on and you can kind of move in and out of, and you still have a good time. You still know what's going on in the plot and, and you still enjoy yourself. And one I've been watching recently is a Netflix show called Friends from College. It has two seasons. Each season's like, I don't know, eight episodes. You know, it, it's not fantastic, but it's enjoyable. It's got a fun cast. It's got, uh, Keegan-Michael Key and Kobe Smulders and Fred Savage and Billy Eichner. Um, so it's got some fun people in it. But one of the things I like about the show is it's it's about a group of, as the title might suggest, some friends from college who meet up later in life. And they're all about our age, which is like mid, you know, late 30s, early 40s. 
And the soundtrack to the show is all these awesome, like, 90s songs. So you'll be watching the show, and half the time I'll be hearing the song and be like, oh, I haven't thought about folk implosion in 15 years or whatever type thing. There, There's a lot of that in there. So it got me thinking, what is your favorite forgotten 90s song? And we start with Mark. Who? Um... Well, I actually really like the drums and natural one by Folk Composure. So had you not said it, that's probably where I would have gone. Um, I am going to go with Ready to Go by Elastica because it's got a cool opening guitar riff. And when the bass and the drums kick in, it really rocks there for a minute. Interesting. I would not have. I would have not have guessed that as you as a Republica guy. So, all right, we have ready to go by Republica, and we kick it over to Maya. Wait a second. Okay, he said ready to go by Elastica. You said he meant ready, ready to go by Republica. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say because I'm an Elastica fan, and I knew that wasn't one of their songs. So. Um, for me, one of the, you talk about a great uh, drum beat for Folk Implosion, that's absolutely right, but uh, the greatest bass line of the 1990s goes to Space Hogs in the meantime, which is an absolutely awesome song, one of hands down, one of the greatest songs of any decade, and it's the only song by that band <laughs> that I've ever heard. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I listen to that probably twice, three times a year, just like we'll put it on YouTube because I love that song so much. So that's my true and honest answer. Okay, wow, we're, we're learning some stuff about people today. Those are both songs I would never have guessed for either of you, and now I'm kind of confused why I got made fun of for liking 311 when you like Space Hawk songs. But anyways... I like Space Hawk song. Song, yeah, that's true. Uh, the answer I had down, which actually the show reminded me of that I totally forgot was one of my favorite songs of the 90s. It's It might be a little too close to home for Maya because he once lost a girl to this lead singer, but it is Super Bon Bon by Soul Coughing. Uh, is my my favorite forgotten '90s song, and uh, I'm, I'm unfortunately I have to give the point to Mark on this one because I really hate that Space Hawk song. <laughs> and uh, while I don't love Ready to Go, I'm more of a Drop Dead Gorgeous guy from the Scream Two soundtrack. You name the band wrong. Fuck off. <laughs> yeah, but you picked a song I don't like. So um, we're gonna give the point to Mark on that one, which is going to put us at. Two to one mark. So Mark has rebounded. Let's switch it on over to. What was that? Allegedly. Allegedly. We're going to switch it over to the box office where uh, glass has been toppled all the way from one to number five as we had a bunch of new movies that hit the box office this week. Now, the Lego movie obviously dominated and it was followed by what what men want came in second place. But let's not forget that the uh, Liam Neeson, who I'm not sure how we like anymore type guy, put put out a movie. And we're not going to delve into the horrible, th- dumb things he said in the lead up to this movie. But we're going to talk about the fact that he's starring in a movie where he's a snowplow driver seeking revenge on the drug dealers that sold him the drugs that overdosed his kid. And as a snowplow driver in a revenge movie, it is obviously called Cold Pursuit, which... <laughs> is amazing to me um and i'm really annoyed with the horrible things that have happened on the press tour because i feel like we would be able to just sit and make fun of the fact that this movie is named cold pursuit for forever but now since we can't really do that because it's kind of a weird iffy topic we are going to talk about what the worst movie name you can think of is so what movie has the worst name and this is going to start in wisconsin with our own Maya Madrid. Well, I know what movie has the best name, and that's Snakes on a Plane, but that's not the question. The worst name of the movie that I think of, um, this just popped in my head because I hated the name at the beginning. Um, I hate it today. It's Kingdom of Heaven, which was the story about the uh, Crusades between, um, or like Orlando Bloom, your guy, Liam Neeson. And um, Jeremy Irons too, I think. I, I don't, I don't know. I saw it for a for a class, and it was an okay movie, but a terrible, terrible name. It was just well, it was that that period where, like, you know, everyone was trying to make a new Gladiator Braveheart. 
yeah. type deal. Yeah, yeah. All right, Kingdom of Heaven. Tossing it over to you, Mark. Um, hmm. Worst movie name ever. I'm. Wow, I'm actually I'm a little stumped on this. Um, hmm. Can we play like some music or something while I, I get my sixty second time out here? Boy, I am near far wherever <laughs> you are. Hmm. Well, Titanic is actually a pretty bad title because that's mostly about it's a love story. A, it's a, of it's a very movie. fitting name, though, for that movie. I feel like that's a bit misleading, but that's not the answer I'm going to go with. Um, I actually just I'm, chose to sing that song because my daughter has a, a keyboard and it has all these like set tracks that you can play other music to. And one of them is My Heart Will Go On by Titanic, and she thinks it's amazing. So... She goes to her room and like just turns on that and plays it on repeat while she just like pounds on the keys. It's yeah, it's something. Wow. Um, okay, I, this I did this won't well, win. This is not very clever, but I'm gonna go with the Imaginarium of Doctor Parnassus, which is an incredibly tongue-tying thing to say. It gives you absolutely no idea what the movie's about. Um, it just sounds weird. And that that's I have nothing more clever than that or, or funny to riff on. But that's my answer. Well, yeah, you guys missed the, the glaring and obvious answer. And I'm a little disappointed because I know you're both giant Tom Green fans. And of course, the answer is Freddy Got Fingered. That, oh, is, that movie is awesome. Regardless, that is a horrible name. And that movie is not awesome <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. I like the sausages. That, uh, Ugh. Uh, you have to agree to disagree, buddy. Just you, you need to stop talking yourself out of points there, guy. <laughs> um, I am not going to give the point to Mark, though, because while that is a really weird name, it's Terry Gilliam. So obviously it's going to have a really goofy, unpronounceable name. That's what, what he does. It's a very fitting. You hear that name and you go, yeah, it's a Terry Gilliam movie. It's probably terrible, but whatever. Uh, so we will give the point by default to Maya on that one. And that is going to put us at two to two. Weird how that happens. So now we're falling into both your guys' wheelhouse as we hit question five. Now, there are a lot of pre... Well, not as many trailers, actually, as we normally get in the Super Bowl, because why would you pay all that money when you can just put it online 20 minutes after the Super Bowl ends? But one we got was the first TV spot for Avengers Infinity War. Now, this is probably the most anticipated movie for most people coming out this year. I'd probably put it at two or three for me. I'm pretty excited about it. Now... One of the things that we know is going to happen, spoiler alert, if you didn't see the first one, Captain Marvel's going to show up, but who would be the best character we have not seen in the MCU that they could introduce in Avengers Affinity War, and Mar- or Endgame, excuse me, and Mark, we are going to start with you. Best new character to introduce in this movie. Oh, easy. Snicked, snicked Wolverine. They're going to go back in time in order to undo this, and that's going to create some kind of... of- mass you know chain of effect that is going to result in mutants now being a part of the marvel universe and of course he's your big money guy that's who you're gonna have i don't know who would cast him but it'll be wolverine glenn danzig maya over to you well this is a tough one because uh there are so many good options um I think this is the time not for Wolverine, though, because Wolverine comes later, and I really want to see X-Men kind of its own deal. And I think X-Men as a story works as its own deal to build up, to put it in the place with the Avengers later on. So I'm going to go with the the group that started it all, and the character out of the group that started it all that would be most fun would be The Thing. And anytime you get The Thing and Hulk, together they have to fight and so i think that would be a great fight uh to you know obviously you have to have the hulk fight something because that's what happens every avengers movie um so i think that would be a great way to introduce the fantastic four and have them go toe to toe with everybody's favorite brawler from yancey street because because 
as we all know, the first Avengers didn't have a giant brawler in the Hulk or a guy who was made of orange rock named the Black Dwarf, who was one of the villains in Thanos' army. So, you know, why not be really derivative and just have the thing in there? Meow. All right. So, uh, as you guys may know, you guys have listed two characters. One of them I may have had a poster of on my wall as I was a child growing up. And because of that, I think he would be a horrible addition to that movie. I mean, what's he going to do? Like, try and cut Thanos? Like, with his claws? Like, he's going to stab shit. Yeah, I get it, but he's not going to stab anything that matters. So I, I want someone that would actually help the outcome of a battle against Thanos. And Jeremiah, or... And Maya didn't pick the right character, but he was on the right track. Because the character I want that could actually be introduced and then could lead into a series of other things, maybe even a Fantastic Four movie, but could really contribute to this battle, is, you know, maybe a world leader with super intelligence. And that is why I want to bring in Doctor Doom. Like, he could actually assist the Avengers to come up with an outcome to stop this Thanos problem, even if it's for his own game. And and then or his own ends, and then he can move off into his own movie. So I'm going Doctor Doom. Maya was in the right ballpark by picking the thing, so I'm gonna go point Maya on this one, and he has regained the lead after stumbling behind. I was thinking about Doom, and then I couldn't figure out quick enough a way to put him in properly, nor Reed Richards. So I'm embarrassed. You know, we're under the gun here. You've thought about these questions for a while, so. Um, that's why I went with the thing. So. Oh, the research, the research I do into these questions would blow your mind. Okay, we are at question six. Maya's at the lead, so this could be the uh, the put away shot. Mark's got to step up big. Now, another movie that might be anticipated by some, I, again, I put it in the 2-3 range for me, that we didn't hear about in the Super Bowl, is Star Wars Episode Nine, And I'm sure we're going to get all that in April at Star Wars Celebration, and they'll announce the name and whatnot. But, as of right now, despite rumors and, you know, announcements of agreements, this is the only Star Wars movie that is scheduled to be released, and the only movie currently in production. Now, we have several TV shows that are in production, including The Mandalorian, which is going to debut with the new Fox or the new Marvel, Disney, Star Wars streaming service, whatever you want to call it. But what year will we see the next Star Wars film in theaters? And this is going to start with Maya. I think it's, it's going to be sooner than you think. I think it'll be three years. And I think it's... So just say that you're out loud. What's that? Say the year out loud. So this is 2019, so that's 2022. Okay. I think it'll be 2022 because I think what will happen is this little break plus the end of this trilogy will reinvigorate a lot of people um, from both sides of this stupid aisle that the world seems to be on um, about The Last Jedi. And so as soon as this is a huge success, which it will be both critically and financially, the gears will start moving and I, I don't know if that means that it's um, that it's what's his face's trilogy or something different, but it's going to be within three years because they'll have to get all the casting and do everything, and all be you know, and the special effects will take a long time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna guess it's three years. All right, 2022, Mark. <clears throat> Excuse me. So my thought is. Well, there's twofold. I think going forward that Disney is really looking to Marvel to be their big movies. And I think that they're going to want to eventually ramp up even more of their production. And they're going to want to stake out the the Christmas um, theater season for yet another Marvel movie. So I don't think they're actually looking to have uh, another Star Wars come out in the big theaters. I think Star Wars is going to become more focused on this new streaming. And as a result of this platform, um, that it's going to have lesser demands, I think we are going to see a new Star Wars Christmas special in 2020, streaming (laughs) exclusively on the Marvel service. Okay, so... Uh, you guys, you guys split the difference between 2020 and 2022 because I had 2021 
Um, so you both are are right there, and I guess we'll go with Price is Right rules because that makes question seven more interesting, and we'll give it to Mark on that one, I guess. They're all bullshit today for the champion. You are the whiniest competitor in the history of this game, and that is saying a lot since there's three total competitors in the whole game. Oh, the world's against you, man. The world's against you. No, just you are. Question... <laughs> Yes. Question seven. Name your favorite moment in Aquaman. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, so question question seven is actually a question that's all about me because I'm moderating today. So it's going to be something that falls specifically into my interests and my likes and dislikes, but also something that's current and happening now. We've already seen a remake of Halloween that was very successful. We're getting the remake or reimagining of Child's Play that is coming out soon. So I need to know, what was the best creation out of 80s horror? So it has to be something that was created in the 80s. So, like, for instance, Halloween was created in the 70s. So you can't be like, I love Halloween too, blah, blah, blah. No one gives a fuck. That's not when it was created. Same with The Thing. The Thing is based on a movie from the 50s. So what great horror property was the best from the 80s? Hmm. And and do I go first or does you go first, sir? Because it is an odd number. Okay. Well, um, you can ask I'm clarifying not... questions. I will. I will allow it in this round. I can ask clarifying questions. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, like, um, if you're gonna be like, does aliens count? I'll be like, no, because <laughs> Alien was in the '70s. Yeah. No, that actually would have been my answer, but Alien was '79, so that doesn't apply. Um, the greatest creation of horror movies in the 80s um i am going to go with the chuds if for no other reason than that is an awesome ass name for a horror show monster some good daniel stern work in that movie as well so we have chuds as an answer did not see that coming. This has been a game of curveballs. You guys have kept me on my toes as a moderator between Space Hog and uh, Chuds. We've like we've we've seen it all. I just don't like that song. Lead singer was briefly married to Liv Tyler. That's my interesting fact of the day. Really, you have a generous definition of interesting. I'll go with. Um... Um, I don't know, was Evil Dead in the 80s? I am 90% sure that it was. But we will call in your clarification. Oh, man, I just, I scrolled by something on the internet. I shouldn't have cheated. But, so I'm going to go with the e uh, Evil Dead. Evil Dead was 1981. Okay. 1981. The, uh, the, the, the true answer should be Gremlins, but um, I'm going to go Evil Dead's what I said, so I'll go with that. All right. Well, the 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 answer is Hellraiser. Pinhead from Hellraiser is is the greatest 80s horror monster creation of the time. Love that guy. Uh, see the first two. Don't see anything after that. Hopefully we get a real reimagining of that at some point and not one with Craig Sheffer. Anyways, uh, I, I take my horror seriously. And no. um, one of one of you picked a movie I really like, and one of you picked a movie I really like, but not because it's actually a good movie. Which means, because I value the integrity of the game, despite someone's constant crybaby bitching and whining for the last God knows how long this has been going, 38 minutes, I am unfortunately going to have to award the point to Maya Madrid. Cry me a river. You are the champion today. Well done, sir. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, in the, in the vein, Davis, one of my heroes, who fought against the league, time in, time out, had an uphill battle for the entirety of his life, especially as owner of the Raiders. I just want to say, just win, baby. Play the music. Wait, when, when do the Raiders win? They won two Super Bowls. <laughs> you wouldn't know anything about that. Shit. I know, because I wasn't born. <laughs> it didn't work, you dumbass. It's 1983. Now play the music. 